welcome back, everybody. This is the second episode of our Cocktails with Patty. I hope you enjoyed the first one. Um, I did. I got a really fantastic response from everybody. Anyway, on to the next one. The next is Nick Cook. Nick Cook. Nick is an old friend of mine. I met him when Eric and I were married, and he used to come over to the house quite a lot. And... Um, We've shared lots of friends in the past, lots of lunches, dinners, parties, everything. And in fact, we were part of a, a smallish group that went to um, Peru. And we went to Peru for all sorts of experiences, including a little taste of ayahuasca, which really sets you off. Anyway, it was great fun. And um, so Nick and I have remained friends for four years. And... Because he's very interesting and he's very eloquent and has really excellent stories, I thought, although he's not a musician as such, well, he does play a bit of bongos, um, that he is he's, he, himself, he's quite rock and roll. And, um, and I think and I hope that you'll enjoy um, our little drinks and conversations. Excellent. OK, so this is Cocktails with Patty and Nick Kirk. This is your drink, isn't it? This is my drink. This is my most favourite drink of all. And what are we going to be drinking this evening? We are going to be drinking a very, very, very dry martini made with gin. Yeah. Tiny bit of vermouth. Mm -hmm. Don't even really want it in there. You can just sort of wave the bottle at it. And we're going to have olives. And it's obviously going to be shaken, as you've just heard, not stirred and served ice cold in a large glass and one drinks it and basically it's the drink that is like a mainliner it puts you on your backside quicker than any other drink there is what happens to me is my brain carries on talking but my legs stop working and after two that's it nick i've always thought too many cocktails is it just two is it Three can be disaster. Um, I would completely agree with you. However, if you can hold three, the world becomes a different place. <laughs> I'm and if sure. you go into the bars in the States, the Americans are unbelievable martini drinkers. People like all those guys, you know, they drunk martinis coming out of their ears. And they are very good at it. I can't drink them. Two's enough for me. Did, now, did the martini, was it, was it started by a mixologist in New York? Well, Patricia, I don't really know. I just drink the things. Yeah, of course. But frankly, I suppose the Hollywood set were really the famous ones for the martinis, weren't they? You think about the Sinatra and all, and all those guys. Their set was very keen on the martinis. And it seems to be wherever you looked in the old films, they were drinking martinis. Slightly different from this, of course, James Bond probably made them very famous to the most of the people who didn't drink. Um, I think he liked vodka in his. Oh. Um, rather than the gin. And the, the old, old martini was a gin. And I just like classic things. I like them straight and, and that's it. That's okay. where I go for it. All right, I'm going to take a sip. And cheers to you and to everybody listening. Cheers. Take care. And we have to, I have to talk about how we first met. OK, well, we better do it now before we drink it. Cause I'm <laughs> going to go talk he won't to you, remember. Uh, well, I'll talk to you in the morning about it. Um, hmm. Oh, perfect. Yeah, pretty good. Huh? It's perfect. Pretty good. Um, we first met, I guess, at Eric's house. Um, well, you, yours and Eric's house, of yeah. course. Um, gosh, way back. Um, early 70s, somewhere around there. Yes. Um, qu quite how, I don't know why. Um, but obviously just through mutual friends. I think it was all and mainly to do with cars. Cars, Eric yeah. Because loved cars, in particular yeah. Ferraris. Yeah. I remember rocking up in an old... D-type Jaguar, I think Oli Tobias was with me, or something like that. Yeah. And, um, and then I do remember commissioning you for your first photographic um, 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 assignment. I mean, you probably won't talk about that, but um, as you did for the local newspaper. And it was all fun. 
Now, I think you reminded me the other day that many years earlier, you were with my first husband, George, in America. That's true, yeah. What were you doing there? I went with George and uh, Olivia to the American Grand Prix, Watkins Glen Grand Prix. And I was flying on Allegheny Airlines and uh, George was there and Olivia was uh, sitting next to me. And of course, whenever there's a beetle enters anywhere into any place, it doesn't take long, the whole place goes silent. They go, oh my God, you know, this, it goes quiet. But anyway, we arrived in um, Buffalo, up, up New York, and um, Dennis Kenyon from Dark Horse Records, George's record company, yeah. and they also did the um, Monty Python films, met us at the airport. And I just remember being, being younger than George and, and sitting in the back of this sort of, not limousine, but a car with Dennis driving, George one side, Olivia the other. I had to sit in the middle because she didn't want to sit by the wind, uh, in the middle. And the radio was on. <laughs> And on came Mal of Kintyre. And I remember George going, well, yeah, there's our Paul. I thought, well, there's our Paul. Christ, this is a champagne moment. I've definitely arrived here. <laughs> <laughs> it's our bloody Paul on the radio. I thought, OK, that'll do. That's so, so sweet. So that's why I got to so sweet. accompany George to um, yeah, marry. We were quite fairly good friends because he used to follow the Grand Prix circuit, and that's what I was doing at the time. Yeah, and, and thinking of Grand Prix circuits, I remember you telling me that uh, you were a, being a helicopter pilot, mm -hmm. as well as a gentleman farmer, of course. Mm -hmm. But anyway, in your helicopter piloting days, you rescued someone from um, a frightful car crash. Well, yes. I, Carlo. I, uh, no, no, I, I think you're no. thinking about Nicky Lauda and Ner yeah. Nürburgring, yeah. I was, um, I can't say rescue, because many, many, many other people were there doing the whole thing. But I flew him around and... Um, after these accidents and then um, took him to Monza for the first Grand Prix back after his um, accident. He missed the Dutch Grand Prix and the Austrian Grand Prix and came back at Monza and no one ever thought he'd come back. Um, Enzo Ferrari at the time thought this is impossible and they, they employed Carlos Reutemann to take his place but that got Nicky so angry. And I remember sitting next to him in the helicopter and he's so badly burnt. He just smelt. He was, and I, we were on very good terms. I said, God, Nicky, God, what a smell. He said, well, like, you try being burnt like me and see what you're like. <gasps> so you could still so, smell the burn? Oh, he was in burn. a shocking state. Wow. And they made a special helmet for him to go over his ears and his face and his hands. And um, it is all, all, all in the book, but I remember going into the pits at Monza with Marlene, his wife, and Willie Dungle, his trainer, and the head of Ferrari then. And Nicky went out did the first few laps in qualifying and said, came back in. So I can't do this, I'm, I can't do it privately to, to us. I just sat there. And then he, um, he's just, I heard, heard this man talk to himself. Do I, why am I sitting here? Do I want to do this? What, what am I frightened of? Why can't I keep my foot flat through the Lesmo curve to right hand the bend at Monza, which is flat out 200 miles an hour? And he said, right, okay, right, this is what I do, this, I'm going to do it. And with this sheer determination, which as hard Austrians can do, yeah. you know, because he's a hard man, Nicky. He got in the car, struck this helmet on. I doubt he got the helmet off his burns. I mean, got in there and put it forth on the grid. Ah, <gasps> did he? Yeah. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And from that season on, James won the world championship. James Hunt. Yeah, and then Nicky would then won it the year after that. Right. So um, yes, now I've had some. Very interesting times, but nowhere near as interesting as drinking a martini cocktail with you, Patricia. Nick, you are so good. Your flattery is, sir, uh, we'll get you anywhere. We haven't told everyone where we are. Um, well, that's a secret. We're in a shed. We are in a shed. We're a in a shed garden shed. In the garden, in the woodlands. Mm -hmm. And it's very quiet here. No yeah. wild animals are allowed in. No, 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 except the children. Because they're sort of wild animals, but <laughs> and it's very peaceful. Yeah. And it's nice here, and everyone likes to have a shed to retire to. So, Nick, what you're going to have to do, darling, is to tell me exactly what we have, the recipe for this. Well, the recipe for this is very, very easy. I mean, I never really go by recipes, but it's a slug of gin. So, basically. I can't say a slug. I have right, to well, say. Can, okay, a double. Okay, if you really want it perfectly. Mm -hmm. It's two ounces of gin. It's and the gin of your choice. I Nick. like Gordon's. Gordon's, you like, like Gordon's. The good old-fashioned okay. Gordon's gin. London gin's great. 
All the new fancy gins are fantastic, but you know. Not for this. Uh, well, they can be, but I like the Gordons. I'm yes. not a great gin connoisseur, but no. but I like um, I like Gordons. So I had two ounces of gin. Yeah. Half a teaspoon of dry vermouth. Quite frankly, I just like to wave the bottle at it, maybe a drop. And then I like it with a olive or two. That was really delicious. Now, and then, I um, noticed what you did. You cooled the glasses first. Did you keep them in yeah. the fridge? Why not? Glasses in the fridge first. If you're going to have a nice drink, you don't pour them into warm glasses, do you? No. You, know, you might as well cool the glasses. And then I like it to be shaken. Shaken, not stirred. Shaken, not stirred, as James Bond would say. And um, poured out. And then sit there and... If you have two of those, an hour later you're talking absolute rubbish. But meanwhile you're just purring as you drink every sip. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> now Nick, um, I'm just thinking about you and how diverse you can be. And a few years ago when we were all allowed out to have fun mm -hmm. and make merry, mm -hmm. you were in Kenny Jones's band, weren't you? Mm -hmm. Yes. Because Kenny, dear Kenny, owned the polo club and every so often he'd... Um, get a band to play yeah. for us all to listen to, drink to, dance to, whatever. Absolutely. So it was so funny for me. Thinking, yes, suddenly what see on earth me is there. Nick doing on stage? Well, I think both, <laughs> I mean, most, our generation, most people, they want to be a rock star. That or the pilot of the Red Arrows, maybe. But they want to be a rock star. So if you want to be one, well, come on, give it a crack, you know. So I did, and certainly not a rock star and I'm not a very, I wouldn't put myself in the, in the realms of a musician at all, but very luckily I knew a lot of people in the music business and I used to try and play the drums but um, pretty useless at that. And well, I was at, I was at the school and uh, I was uh, practicing for the school hop with the school band and I'm messing around the drums like that and you know, there's little horrible annoying American kids in the corner and after I'd been finished, you know, he came out and said, Nick, yeah, can I borrow your kit? Just play with the, with the band for one time. I said, no, go away. Or go away, child, you know. Oh, Nick, come on. The band said, come on, give me. Oh, no. It was only, what's his name from police? Um, Stuart Copeland. <laughs> <laughs> so no. I was ousted from the school bands. I lost my girlfriend. He then had to teach her, can I borrow your kit for the next gig? And I had then had to be going, oh, yeah, okay, no, no problem. You know, you borrow my kit, you know. Um, so then I thought, well, then we had our local bands as boys, but I thought percussion would be good. And a guy called um, um, Phil Manzanera from Roxy, who was being sort of South American as well, had a band called Phil and the Coconuts. So he said, come on, Nick, come and play. And um, so I played with him and he stuck with me. And Henry Spinetti, you know, Eric's old drummer, you know, Henry put up with me and taught me a lot and coaxed me along and then, um, and then, you know, I'd played lots of stuff with them. And then Kenny came along and was very, very patient with me. And I played with Kenny, played with them for 20, 30 years. And played, as you know, everywhere. Oh, so fun. But I'm still the, still feel embarrassed in rehearsals and all that, or in the studio or something. You get, Stop, Nick, can you play that again? Oh God, they're going to hear everything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm there for the, you know, it's fun. But, you know, I'm certainly not a professional, but we have a good time. We laugh Such up. fun. It's so yeah. fun. But you're so clever. You, you can do so many different things. Oh, um, Master, and what, not, not, Jack of all trades, but Master I, at none. I don't know. I don't know about that. But um, I saw you playing polo quite a lot, mm. which I think is the most amazing game to watch. And mm. polo players are so extremely brave. I mean, you know, almost, they're almost <laughs> We're not out, terrified of, the entire out, time. out of the saddle, just yeah, 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 yeah. leg on one stirrup. And yeah, but I was never very good at it, but I was all right. Mike Rutherford is a better polo player than me. That really irks me. But, uh, <laughs> and Kenny was a good polo player. Yeah. Actually, it was Kenny that got me going playing polo too, funny enough. But I just joined in. I was never very good at it. But, but thoroughly enjoyed myself. It was a privilege to play that game. It's the, the, it's the, the king of sports is horse racing and the sport of kings is polo. Yeah, I, I sometimes think that in my next life I'd like to come back as a polo player. Because it looks so exciting. I'd like to come back top of the food chain. But we ain't coming back as a human being. No, so or out of the rabbit. animal kingdom, yeah. who would you like to come back as? Probably like to fly. 
Golden eagle would be cool. Which those enormous birds in South America? Condors. Condors. You remember that time you were in South America? I would love to come back as a condor. You, you were in South America, but yeah. you went on that. Why? I and what do they call that stuff? Ayahuasca. Ayahuasca trip. Yeah, that was interesting. That was quite fun, wasn't it? Yes, it's that was very was. interesting. Not for Westerners, really. To, to do it Not properly. for the faint-hearted either. No, no, that's for sure. <laughs> no, that was a, that was a, that, uh, that Amazon jungle. God, middle of nowhere, having jetted out of Heathrow, 20, 12 hours, fourteen hours later, you're in Lima, overnight in Lima. Then you're on an aeroplane. Then you're on this canoe or boat going up the Amazon, and the Amazon's very threatening. You get up the top reaches there, and it's brown, and the logs are all going down, and it's and it's misty and it's rainy. You get put into this tent, don't you? Yes, and into you meet a this, lodge. Yeah, into a lodge. Into a lodge and you meet open. this shaman of the jungle and he talks to an interpreter of what you're going to do and what you're not going to do and what's your problems and how do you hold your anxieties. And so then, they, then you go out into the jungle and you cut the vine down and then he makes the ayahuasca out of the vine and then you, he has a ceremony <coughs> and you all lie in a circle, and there's a fire, and he's in the middle of going, he's trying to get, and he's putting incense on the fire and all that sort of stuff. And, uh, and we're all giving and, a bit. Yeah, you have to drink this thing, and it's, uh, it, it's, um, it makes you either uh, uh, be sick or, or, or the other end. So anyway, I was probably one of the first to, a couple of people fainted in the corner. And he's going, oh, no. he's got his condor wings, everything flapping, around, it's boiling hot, and Christ, and the rain's coming down. And, um, <laughs> and I suddenly feel, and I go for this bowl at the end of my thing. And I forget, he's standing over me with his flapping his wings, oh, no. and he's trying to make me go into the bowl. And he's going, and I go, oh, he made fuck off, there's only room for one in this bowl. <laughs> <laughs> and Roger was there, everyone's laughing, and then you lie back and you go, oh my God, and then you go, Woof. quite an experience, quite an experience. Yeah, really that was good. extraordinary, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, 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 it was. You meant to find yourself. But you see, the guy who was chanting was actually holding us mentally. Without him chanting, I would have lost it because he's, he is the fulcrum. We could mentally know he's there. He's somebody for us to hold on to. Meanwhile, your brain's exploding and going out there. You always know that actually your mind is more powerful than anything. So, um, yeah. yeah. That's so true. As we walked into the room where we were all going to be lying down and taking the ayahuasca, I noticed in one of the beams of the passageway there was the most enormous snake. Yeah. And he was curled up in the corner. And having grown up in Kenya, I just thought, oh, it's a snake, it's a snake. No one else spotted him. And then later on, about five, six hours later, however long this drug lasts, I came out to go to my room. The snake had gone, but what he'd left was his skin. And I thought this was representative of what's meant to happen to us. We were meant to get rid of old stuff that we don't need anymore. Yes, I think, uh, yes, I, I agree with all that. But however, I think you had to immerse yourself in, in the culture of the people that lived there. For us, I think it was just too quick. 24 hours out of London and in, and you're, <coughs> you're experiencing it, but you're not really understanding it. I that, see. That was my point. I see. Except for when we went to Lake Titicaca and we took that other stuff. That other it's, stuff, it's, everything it's, looked purple, purple to me. Yeah, yeah. Was, I think Jimi Hendrix wrote Purple Haze on that stuff. Maybe that's what he'd heard. We don't know. So Lake Titicaca is the, the highest lake in the world. The highest navigable lake in the world. Ah, the, the, the water the, was so busily cold. Then we went and got on a boat and we went to an <laughs> island. That's right. And yeah. we all got off where there was another, we had another shaman with Shaman us. from the mountains. Shaman from the mountains this time. Mm. And he gave us, what was it called, Nick? San Pedro. San Pedro. It was basically the top of the cactus. So I sat up and everybody and everything was purple. It was extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. And then we got on our boat, still a little high, and stopped off at another island that was made of... Um, well, the famous floating island. It's a floating island. Yeah, where they all live on there. And these, and these... Of reeds, made of reeds. <laughs> oh, 
People were living there. <laughs> There were chicken and children and laundry and oh. And you're stomping around in this thing. Was, you don't know whether you're seasick, you're not Where the dry. hell are we? <laughs> it was an interesting trip. I remember I had my birthday up there in the mountains with a shaman. And they're, everyone's a little bit, not in awe of the shamans, but they're quite spiritual people. And um, they made this birthday cake for me. And there's I don't know, 15, 20 people who were on that funny place up in the mountain. And the shaman was there saying, and they'd made this cake for me, beautiful cake. And he said, well, and then, he, and through an interpreter, you know, in the tradition in Peru that, um, you know, that the person whose birthday is, before they cut the cake, they bow to the cake like this, so and then he can say his prayer to the cake and then they can spread it. So I say, all right, all right. So as I put my head down to bow to the cake, the shaman put his hand behind my head, squashed <laughs> <down laughs> straight into the cake. So I came out covered in the... I thought, all right, all right, mate. So they have the same sense of humour as us. <laughs> Do you remember that? I don't remember. I came out with ice cream. That is was... hysterical. Yeah. I've got lots of, lots of photos of you before that happened. How did I miss that? They thought I was a crazy oh man. God. They couldn't quite work me out. Shaman, but, uh, yeah, no, so they all, we all have a sense of, same sense of childish humour. Yeah. If you think about it, it's extraordinary that from the year dot, man has always tried to scramble his brain. Wow. It's true. From, wow. from some form of, I mean, the Red Indians were, you know, smoking this and that and the other. I'm not sure what Adam and Eve were up to, but take the apple and I'll tempt you into that or whatever. And then if you go back as far as you can in, in history, wherever you go back, they've been making wine, they've been making something that wants to alter their brains and have a good time and make it a, you know, and it's been going on forever, the entire time. So we've never been absolutely satisfied with um, having a complete straight, straight brain. And, you know, it's always something that we've had, whether it's been cigarettes or marijuana or alcohol or berries. You know, look at look at the people in the, in when I was out in the Far East, the the, the jungle, the betel nut. You know, they're chewing on the betel nut, yes. gives them a slight high. The cocoa leaves in South America, yes. chewing those, and then everywhere, um, even the Eskimos had that sort of fatty thing from the walrus that they, that they killed and it got them high. So everyone's always been looking to get a, an extra stimulus somewhere. It's quite odd, really. That and, is so uh, interesting. It's true though, isn't it? Man has always tried to do that. And then of course they get to a point where it gets too far. And then they've got to pull back from that area and there's never a, a counterbalance. So just being is not enough, it's not satisfying I, enough. I think it probably is once you get round to the point of realising that it is. Yeah, so does this mean that we're dissatisfied with what we are and what we have? No, no. We want more, do you think? No, I what don't think so. I just think, um, hey, take that berry, see what that does. Well, all right, then I'll... Just, so it's an oh, adventure. Oh, wow. You know. <laughs> I don't think there's anybody being dissatisfied with what they've got. Obviously, when you get down to the, you know, the, the real, you know, you go then heroin and that sort of stuff can hide, and you go into a slumber land and you hide from what you're doing. But normally, I think that it was just, hey, you know, have one of these berries. Ooh, wow, that's interesting. And it's mushroom. Yeah, and also the creative side of it. it people used to think, let's face it, that they could be more creative. Um, it would make them more creative thinking yeah. about that, and probably it did. But um, I'm certainly no expert on it, and I'm probably talking an absolute load of nonsense. No, but I think. But I'm just saying how it appears to be. You can't really argue with it because everyone wants a drink or yeah. something. Yeah. yeah, it's very interesting. I hadn't really thought about that before. But it's true. It's like we want a little bit more, we need a little more. More, really? I think so. They always say, you know, what's the best thing is. To need more is to need less, or to need less is to need more. Something frightfully wise. You mentioned on, was it the Amazon, the trip that you went on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That the, the purpose behind that was to um, clear your mind or find, find peace. Do you think there's an element of that? that I think it was. I think it was to, um, to go and with, with people that you were with to try and understand how you were working out with them, really. But also to get rid of any old stuff that you didn't need any longer yeah. in your consciousness. You know, to get rid of stuff that's shit, basically, and is in the way of you progressing. So, you know, by being sick, as Nick talked about, or going to the loo, it's eliminating 
what we don't necessarily need anymore in our lives. I can't say it worked for me. Um, it didn't actually, um, but it was a very interesting You're exercise. much nicer now, Nick. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> nice, isn't it? Well, it's nice. Um, it's a bit of a day, isn't it? Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I, yeah, it's an odd thing to do. There were probably about 10 or 12 of us. Yeah, and it worked for a lot of people, but not for all. No, but it was a very interesting study in people who know each other, not terribly well, always, going away to an outpost. It was challenging. An outpost. It was challenging. Walk the Inca Trail, you know. Yeah. And it was, you know, it was just, we were, we were so privileged and lucky to be doing this. Can you remember your experience of that? Was, did you find the, the freedom or the peace that, that you? What I saw was um, uh, ge geometrical s signs and uh, it was almost like a jigsaw puzzle in my mind whenever I shut my eyes and I wasn't sure whether to follow the snakes or the ladders and it was just really uh, bizarre, mm. bizarre. So I didn't see any immediate um, realisation as in I might if I were meditating. Mm. And then, then I thought, oh, maybe it's uh, just getting rid of old stuff, old stuff that I've accumulated through um, life. So 20 years ago, compared to now, we've just gone through this lockdown. Hopefully it's coming to an end. Um, but do you think there was anything that perhaps you may have learnt on that trip or um, anything that you might have subconsciously used? Definitely. Yeah. I think the thing that I learnt, we were all friends, inverted commas, but we learnt tolerance with each other. Because okay. everyone's having a pro they, everyone's going through something. Mm. That's why we all went there with a person that led us as a spiritualist and we went there. And I think we all learned to be very tolerant of each other and support each other. Yeah, and, and understanding. Uh, yeah, and, and quite opposite characters. I mean, really, we shouldn't name people that were on it because that's, that's you know. But um, they were some very interesting people, some very well-known people. Some, um, but, and, and we were learned tolerance. Tolerance and humility. We yeah. had to be humbled in one, yeah. one yeah. situation. We were up in the mountains and uh, we couldn't go any further. We had to stay in a backpacker's hotel. Well, some of our friends didn't even know what backpackers were. You know. I sent so. the wine back, so always his <laughs> <laughs> But you know, we all had to stay in the same place. Mm. And that was such an experience, and really good for all of us. Yeah, but yeah, yeah it's true. Yeah. That was it, fun, was, wasn't it? Yeah. But they all do ayahuasca now. Everyone has ayahuasca parties in LA and America, and they have yeah. in London, and Everywhere. it's lost its. Um... But, you see, but we it... went into the jungle, cut the vine. That was the. Vine. This was the proper way to and do it. Did it with yeah. the... Your journey was very much a. Uh, Almost spiritual kind of discovery. Very. Yes, it was. Versus just, hey, let's party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, it, it was. It's not party. It, it wasn't party, no. Yeah. Might sound like it, but it was. It was bloody poor. Christ. It was quite rough. At heavy, times. heavy, heavy duty. Yeah. Well, Nick, that was so delicious to enjoy this fabulous martini with you. It's absolutely my pleasure. So every time I drink a martini now, I will think of you. Well, that's very sweet. And what, what more could a man want? I really enjoyed listening back to um, the conversation I had with Nick. He's so amusing and he's very entertaining. And um, so I was lucky to catch him, catch him that evening for our drinks, because he's an interesting chap. He's uh, an incredible guy. I, um, I love listening to him. He's got such a wonderful voice. For he podcasts. has. I, I want him to have his own podcast <laughs> so I can continue to listen to him. Oh, wouldn't he love that? That'd be great. Nick, He'd love it. Nick, if you're listening, you should start your own podcast. <laughs> um, you could do it in your helicopter. That'd be amazing. Um, so yeah, what a great episode. That was fun. We, we got quite deep in that. Episode. Well, we did. I think once we started talking about the powers of ayahuasca and uh, the spirituality that is endemic with, with the tribal people, but not so much in the West when people take it here. Mm, mm. Um, it's a whole different thing over there. And, um, and I think that Nick was right in saying that, you know, from London, two mm. days later, we're, we're in a completely different environment. And then we took this incredible 
um, herb drug. Yeah. Whereas maybe we should have been in living in the jungle for at least a week, ten days, mm. and to really feel it and to understand it, mm. Mm. and then take ayahuasca. Yeah, interesting. What what a journey! What an adventure! It really was. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yes. Very cool. Okay, so um, if you're watching on YouTube, then uh, you might notice we've made a little bit more uh, of an effort to create a, a, a nice environment to watch. Um, and we're going to continue to, uh, to develop that. Um, but if you want to follow what it is that Patty's doing, um, you can do that uh, on Facebook. If you search for Patty Boyd Official, um, you can follow uh, Patty on Instagram at Patty Boyd Official. You can uh, follow on Twitter, which is at the Patty Boyd, um, and then on YouTube if you search for Patty Boyd official and you can listen to the podcast on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. If you're enjoying these episodes we would love to hear from you. If you want to leave a review um, please do that'd be great um, and if you have a message for Patty then by all means um, send it through on, on one of the socials and uh, hey if you've got any questions about any of the episodes maybe send them through and, and we can perhaps talk about those next time. Um, so that's about it for this episode. I believe we're going to go and feed the alpacas today. Should we do that? Why not? That'd be great. They're little hungry boys. They are indeed. <laughs> so if you're watching on YouTube, we're going to finish the episode and then we're going to go and feed the alpacas. But before we do that, um, Patty, who do we have next week? Next week, we have um, a very dear friend, Mike Rutherford. I'm friends with him and his wife, Angie. Um, and um, I can't remember what we drank, but Mike's very, very interesting. He's been in Genesis and of course he has his own band. And um, they, Genesis, will be playing at O2 on, in two weeeks' time on, on the, the 12th. Uh, 12th of October. I'm going and looking forward to that. Are you? You're going? Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, that's going to be great. Yeah. Going by boat. Wow. Going there by boat, which is really nice, and then come back by train. Amazing. Very, very cool. I look forward to hearing about that. And uh, we'll see everyone and connect with everyone next week. To, uh, who are we going to see? We can see um, the alpacas, mm -hmm. three boys, and they're very sweet sometimes. Come on, there's a good boy. Who's a good boy? Do you want some apple? Do you want some apple? Can you take it from my hand? No. Here, here, here. here. Come on, Fudgy. Fudgy, Fudgy, Fudgy. Come on. Meringue, of course, is the greediest. Because he's the boldest. You silly boy, aren't you silly? No. Come on. Far. Right. So near. Come on, Daddy. Right? <laughs> you think about it. You think about it. Come on, try again. Come on.